So to give you just a sense of what um, treatment would look like if you were doing one of these evidence-based practices, there's pretty much always an agenda. So with evidence-based practices, as most of you know, there's always pretty much a structure for how you're doing things, but there's always flexibility with infidelity. So it doesn't have to be a boxed approach, but if it's a short-term treatment, then kids need to do certain things to finish in that brief time. And so the clinician has a guide for what they're doing, and so it's either in their head or written down, but they have an agenda for how they'll spend the session. And most of that session is actually spent practicing. So learning about anxiety, but moving quickly to facing your fears. If they're not fears you can face in the session, like it's a school phobia, then it's working with the kid and the caregiver on how to gradually, step by step, face those fears outside the session. How many of you have ever, how many of you have kids or have ever had a kid that you've assigned homework to as a therapeutic intervention? Planning for homework takes a lot of time. It's not, as you can all attest to, just like, all right, so when you go home, why don't you try today to go by the schoolhouse, and then the next day, why don't you go in, and the third day, why don't you stay in for 30 minutes? Done, right? It never works. So a lot of the session you end up spending really planning for how that homework is going to happen. But when you can, you practice in the session. I had a clinician last week. The kid had, had a generalized fear based on a traumatic incident of crossing the street, and so my recommendation was the next Tuesday they spend the whole session going outside and crossing the street together on the crosswalk, and she crosses it by herself. Best way to spend the session, because the best way to get over avoidance is to actually face your fears. And you always want the caregiver involved, because how many kids are going to do their homework just on their own? <coughs> Not very many. So you want the caregiver involved to reinforce what happens in the home. So this is just an example of what you know, an agenda might look like if you met half with the kid, if you met half with the parent. Big focus, as you can see, on homework, which we've taken to calling weekly practice. Homework is not a positive term for kids, usually. <laughs> we say this in an academic setting where all of us are sometimes dying for homework we're lifelong learners, but kids, so now we call it weekly practice, with a little bit of a reward because facing what you're afraid of isn't easy. So kids need a little bit of a reward sometimes or encouragement to want to do it. So these are the common elements of evidence-based practice. How many of these do you guys think happen frequently in community-based settings? Which ones would you say? Look at them for a second. Which ones do you think are most common? Coping strategies, Coping strategies absolutely. What else? <laughs> Bruns is making, he's like, ah, yeah, mm, a little bit. I would say not that common because it's hard. But maybe. Attempts at it, a little bit at coping. What else do you think probably happens commonly? There's one more that I think people do a decent job of. Yeah, psycho ed. I think pretty much everybody goes into um, treatment with a little bit of psycho ed. So I would pretty much agree with you guys that coping strategies is common. I think psycho ed is pretty common. I think cognitive restructuring, like you were saying, Andrew, might come up some, but whether it's not an easy one to do without some training, and so it's a little challenging. But what I also see in community-based settings for anxiety disorders, when it's not the evidence-based version, is a lot of feelings work, a lot of non-directive work, maybe some play therapy, and a lot of other supportive but non-directive work outside of play therapy. Now, what did I say was the key thing to get better from anxiety? Exposure, right, facing your fears. And so I think one of the major points for me of this talk is just having everyone walk away with the importance of exposure. Now, people don't avoid it in session because they just don't want to do right by kids. I've never met a clinician who does not want to do right by children and help them get better, never. What would be reasons people don't do exposure? What do you think? What happens when you get a kid to face their fears and do exposure? They freak out, they freak out. yeah. They can get a little nervous, right? And most of us did not go into the field of mental health to make kids nervous. <laughs> We went into mental health to make them feel better. But basically, the only way to get over anxiety is to face your fears. I think the other reason people sometimes don't do exposure is often, and I think people have valid reasons for it, we haven't done a great job of introducing evidence-based practices and how there is some flexibility in the way that you do it. And so people feel that they're rigid, that they're lockstep, that they're inflexible. But really, they don't have to be a cookbook approach. They're a little more like a stir fry. That's my analogy. There are certain things that have to go into them and you ought to have a reason for the order that you do things so that you can recognize that it's anxiety treatment, but you do have some flexibility just like you would with a stir fry. 
Yeah. So you mean that um like an activity that the clinician and child would do together that actually relates back to the therapy? Meaning like that wouldn't be the evidence based approach or that would be? Well, like you have other like as a strategy there and so what would something like that look like? So in community based settings I'll see a lot of kids are nervous, they'll have them just play, pretend and do different types of play of other ways things could go versus actually exposing the kid to facing the actual fear. Does that make sense? So I don't do a lot of play therapy or know a lot about it, but I'll hear a lot about that. If a kid is nervous, it'll try to be treated through play. And play is a great way to get kids to face their fears, actually. Play, I mean, that's how kids learn, right? It just has to be play that's a vehicle to get the kid to face their fear. So I don't think I'm actually very well answering your question, though. Okay, yes, yeah, so we're saying the same thing. Just, exactly. So just playing Uno is not treatment at all. So playing Uno as part of five minutes of fun time as a reward for treatment is a great activity. But in terms of as that being the treatment, I absolutely agree. So the point of this slide is saying what I see in community settings often that may not be, that isn't evidence-based or may not be as evidence-based as these major things. I mean, I think some of the people who do the non-directive play therapy, and the idea behind that is that you have kids, you give them a space to play, and that themes emerge as they're playing, where they're kind of like working out their internal struggles that they're having. And there's a whole, there's definitely a group of people that, you know, buy into that sort of you know, kind of organic, right. kind of spontaneous, but the thing is it typically takes a really long time. Right. To emerge, Correct. And certainly we're also talking specifically about anxiety disorders where kids have a fear of certain things and the best way to get over a fear of certain things is to actually face the thing that you're afraid of. So I'm like you too. I'm like, well, how would that connect exactly? And so one of the questions I ask when I'm evaluating treatment is tell me exactly how this connects to the presenting problem and how's the kid doing? Are they getting better? Tell me more about the outcomes. So Again, these are kind of the basic elements, and I'm going to walk through these a little bit so you can see, get a flavor of what they're like. With psychoeducation, these are the major goals. You want the kids to understand, and the caregivers, and the teachers, if the kid's having a lot of anxiety at school, to understand how anxiety develops, how it's maintained. And one of the ways it's maintained is through the A word, right? What is it? Avoidance, right? The more you avoid, the more you want to avoid because the more helpful it is and then the harder it is to face it. So if you avoid something four times in a row, the fifth time if you have to face it, now your fear is even stronger because you've avoided it four times. So avoidance kind of grows anxiety. So you have to help them understand why you want to overcome avoidance even though it might be hard at first. And then also when it's related to trauma, um, you want kids to understand they're not the only one with that problem. I think that's also helpful in other areas of anxiety, but it's particularly important when it comes to post-traumatic stress disorder. And then they need to understand they're not crazy, because a lot of kids with anxiety or other mental health problems, they sort of feel like they're the only one and that there must be something wrong with them. And that's why I love that fear alarm analogy, because it's not that anything's wrong with you. Your fear alarm just got ratcheted up a little bit, and we're going to do a treatment that's going to help turn down the volume. And so kids can kind of buy into that, and it sort of feels normalizing to talk about it that way. Now, the other thing, we're talking about children. They're not self-motivated sometimes to come to therapy. Um, they can be insight-oriented, as many of you have probably seen, but also sometimes they're not, and so being engaging is really key. So I just want to show you an example of an engaging way to do psychoeducation. So this is from the TFCBT website, just a little plug for it. Great videos on this website. And it's a young girl who's been taught a lot of information about um, post-traumatic stress and anxiety and why exposure is important. And now they're clearly doing a review and they're doing it in the form of a radio talk show. Oops. Let me see if I can turn up the volume for you. <laughs> 
Oop, that's the max. Is there a volume control up here anywhere? If not, I'll just keep playing it because we're short on time. But there should be a way to turn this up further in here. Anybody know? Potentially this large volume thing down here. We'll see. Can you guys hear it a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Drive Five, everyone's favorite calling radio show. Thank you. We're truly fortunate to have Jeanette Smith in the studio with us today. And Jeanette is the world's leading expert on what happens to kids after they've been bitten by a dog. She'll be taking your phone calls and answering questions. You can email us at asktheexpert at driveat5.com. Well, Jeanette, before we take any questions from listeners, I get to get the ball rolling and ask the first question. I think a lot of our listeners out there would like to know, what are some common reactions that kids have after they've been bitten by a dog? Well, they might have a great phobia of dogs or like a big fear of dogs, and they might even want, not even want to look at a dog or touch a dog or maybe not even go outside anymore. Maybe not even go outside because, because they're afraid? Yes, they're afraid that a dog might just come furtively or anything might happen. Okay, so that's a serious, uh, serious problem that, that could happen after a dog bite, I see. Well, we have our first caller. Um, are you ready to take your first call? Okay, caller, you're on the air. Yes, um, I have a question for Jeanette. Um, Jeanette, will you ever be able to play with a dog again? Or are you going to be afraid of dogs for the rest of your life? Well, it, it's a slow process, and it takes a long time to get used to being around dogs again. You might have to start from a stuff dog to like, going to a pound. And it'll just be, a lot. It'll, you'll just have to take some time and just get, be prepared. You said a stuffed dog? So tell me a little bit about how a stuffed dog would help. Well, from, you might be scared from seeing a dog, so if you see a stuffed dog, and that, if you know it's not real and can't do anything to you, it might help you just cope with the, like a real dog. Oh, okay, so it's like a gradual process of working up with a stuffed dog to playing with the real dog. Yes. Oh, okay. well, that's good advice. All right. Um, and we have an email question from a listener downtown, and the, the email says, how do you tell the difference between a friendly dog and a dog that might bite you? Well, that's a very good question. Jeanette, what, what's your advice on that? Well, you need to treat every dog like the same just before you get to know the dog, because you never know what kind of dog there is, what kind of dog they are. Okay, so every dog is dangerous until you get to know it. That's some good advice, Jeanette. And right now we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we'll have more questions for Jeanette. So it's great, right? She's learning a lot, but she's having fun, which I think is really key for all of these treatments with kids. Um, just an example of a little kid version, maybe, or not. It might just be frozen on the video for a second. It'll come to it in a second. But, you know, there's a lot of things, I think, especially the other one I'm going to show you is related to trauma. And basically, I think one of the things with anxiety is if you're afraid of something, you're not always dying to talk about it. And so these engagement strategies, I think, are as important as what you teach. All right. Let's just end it. Let me see if that'll let me move on. There we go. So one example is like there's a great book called A Terrible Thing Happened and it's about a little raccoon who goes through something awful but it doesn't name what he went through so it's applicable to a lot of traumas and one of the things I've some of the therapists I've seen do amazing work with this really getting the kids to understand the symptoms of trauma impact by talking about Sherman and Miss Maple is of course the therapist and it's amazing how much kids love this raccoon Sherman and it's just a great psychoeducation resource. And so again, these evidence-based practices with kids, it doesn't have to be dry, it doesn't have to be boring. You can do a radio show, there's great books you can use, you can use a sandbox to teach things. We just have certain goals we wanna accomplish when we're doing it. A big part, I mentioned that self-monitoring is a key component of all the anxiety disorder treatments. And one of the things we do is have kids rate either from zero to 10 or on a thermometer or using a seesaw or a kid in my foster care study he said he wanted to rate his feelings we give kids a lot of choices they're less likely to say no if they have a lot of reasonable choices so he wanted to rate them based on burrito size that was his favorite food big burrito with hot sauce medium burrito with lettuce and a small burrito the small burrito is just plain i don't know why but you know so every time they would talk about how he was feeling while they were doing practice in session she would rate his feelings based on the burrito 